Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Cynthia Robinson, and I'm the director of the Science and Technology Policy Fellowships here at AAAS, and it is a great pleasure to have um, all of you here with us this evening, especially such a great turnout for what is the final event in our 40th anniversary celebratory year. And um, this is the also obviously the final event of the year and the final in our um, distinguished um, speaker series that was launched to be part of the 40th. It has been a very exciting year. We started off with our 40th and largest class of fellows in history. Uh, more than 275 fellows, and this past September welcomed in our 41st class of fellows, another large group. Um, so uh, ending the, f the four decades and launching into our fifth decade, so it's been a really exciting time. And I want to take a couple of minutes just to give you a few highlights um, of where we've been over these past 12 months. Um, we launched um, in the spring Fellows Central, which is a new website, which is the meeting point for um, uh, fellows who are alumni as well as uh, current fellows, and also has lots of information, news, and other um, activity announcements for members of the public to learn more about our program, as well of co as, of course, our um, fellowships pages at AAAS.org. We also um, are very proud to have launched the 40-year interactive timeline. This was a huge undertaking that colleagues of mine worked together on for many, many months, um, and it is chock full of all sorts of fabulous information and tidbits and, and gives you a sense of the evolution of this program um, over 40 years, growing from seven congressional fellows sponsored by four scientific and engineering societies in 1973 to our um, current standing of more than 30 congressional fellows sponsored by more than 30 scientific and engineering societies as well as the additional 200 plus fellows who are in the executive branch um, which is a program that launched in 1980. We also had a wonderful uh, major commemoration event in May where we had a chance to hear about um, the experiences of fellows from each of the four decades um, of our history. And I in particular want to draw your attention to our 40 at 40 initiative. This was a very, very challenging endeavor. We selected one fellow from each of the 40 classes of fellows to be representative. And believe me, that was, was difficult with so many fabulous fellows, more than 2,800 um, alumni of the program now. Um, but these individuals um, just represent some of the broad diversity of disciplines, backgrounds, fellowship assignments, um, activities that they engaged in, not only uh, during their fellowship uh, experience, but um, life beyond the fellowship and the kinds of things that they're engaged in now. And um, those of you who are in the audience who can recognize the little tidbits of the faces that are there in 2003 to to 12, um, that is the fourth and final decade of fellows who are going to actually be announced in the upcoming issue of Fellowship Focus, which will probably not be out until the end of this week. So you're getting a little sneak preview for those of you who, who could recognize some of, some of those faces. We also had a wonderful um, presentation and exhibit um, in the AAAS's um, Science um, and Art Gallery on the Art of Science and Policy, which featured uh, 16 artists from around the country and representing some of the major issues over the past um, 40 years that have um, touched upon the intersection of science and policy. We also had a wonderful um, event uh, to wrap up that um, exhibit where we had artists as well as current and former fellows presenting in a very, very visual format um, about, again, policy issues. Um, this is a current fellow here, Nature McGinn, who's had um, two opportunities to go to the Antarctic in her assignment at the NSF, which is why she is wearing that parka, and talking a little bit about that experience. But it was a really wonderful event, again, highlighting many, many different aspects of the uh, intersection of science and policy. 
Um, the, a group of fellows, current and alumni fellows, also launched Sci on the Fly, the fellows blog, and I hope you'll have, take an opportunity to look at um, Fellows Central to read a little bit more about that. It's a very lively and active blog, um, so new things going up all the time and announcements are easily found on the main page of Fellows Central. And then, as I said, um, we have uh, the Distinguished Speaker Series uh, that started off with um, Norm Ornstein speaking in the spring about the challenges um, and issues going on right now in uh, the U.S. Congress. Um, he is one of the co-authors of the book, The Broken Branch. We moved on to Moises Naim um, in June talking about, very broadly, we went from some very national and U.S. focused issues to international issues talking, and he, has, he had recently written a book called The End of Power and um, talked about the, the theories and issues that he presents in that book and the challenge and, and changing power um, cycles, not, again, not just in the United States, but around the world. And I think it's very fitting um, there, so that first issue talking about current challenges and also looking at some of the past issues of Congress and what led us up to the, some of the impasse that we see happening right now and, and the blockages that are, that are taking place that are hindering uh, the advancement of, of policy. And in particular, I would say some of the issues with the intersection of science and policy. And then again, looking at some of the changes coming up to the present um, and the end of power. And tonight, very fitting that our talk topic is focusing on looking forward, future directions for research and innovation in the United States. So it's, I'm very pleased to introduce to you our speaker, who is Ms. Deborah Wint Smith. She is the president of the U.S. Council on Competitiveness. You can read her full bio, which is in the program that I hope that you picked up when you came in and got your, your name tags and came into the program. But I would like to um, highlight for you just a few um, items from that. And first of all, to explain that the Council on Competitive, Competitiveness is the nation's premier competitiveness leadership organization. It represents U.S. CEOs, university presidents, and labor leaders. And Ms. Winsmith uh, has led that um, organization for a dozen years now. She oversees its national and international initiatives um, that assess competitiveness challenges, convene leaders who can envision and implement solutions, and organize action to enhance U.S. competitiveness. So very, very much forward thinking again and action focused. She is certainly no stranger to the intersection of science, technology, and policy. Indeed, she's been working in that realm for many years with, again, the focus on, on innovation and competitiveness. And she has, um, over her uh, long career, advised many top-level uh, government policymakers and business leaders. And so, again, I think it's very fitting that as we move into the beginning, right now, of this final event of our 40th anniversary year that we focus on the future, please join me in welcoming uh, Deborah Winsmith. Thank you, Cynthia, for that nice introduction. And I'm delighted to be here this evening. Um, I know it's Getting close to our holiday break, and I'm, I'm sure many of you, as, as I am, are looking forward to being with family and friends. So um, I'm delighted to be here tonight. Uh, I think for me, one of my last important activities to close out a, a wonderful year. And of course, it's, it's a great honor to be the uh, speaker for you, closing out this very exciting um, 40th anniversary of the fellowship program. Um, as Cynthia mentioned, you know, I, I've worked in science and technology and the intersection with policy now for many years, having started my career at the National Science Foundation in 1976 and, and served um, in the uh, Reagan OSTP as a uh, detailee from the National Science Foundation and then working in, in the Commerce Department as an Assistant Secretary. And during all that time, the uh, AAAS fellows were very much on the scene and participating in many of, that, of those activities. I, I saw Paul Gilman's picture up there, and I worked very closely with him when he was in the Department of Energy and with Senator Domenici. So you all should be very proud of, of, of what you are doing this year and, of course, through the whole distinguished um, time of the um, fellows. You know, these fellowships play such an important role in providing scientists and engineers an opportunity to see firsthand 
how government shapes science and technology policy, but also, very importantly, how government invests in the activities and the initiatives that will shape our future. I think the program imparts so many vital skills, um, learning better how to integrate uh, knowledge and research into political, economic, and social contexts. And it is really these challenges and problems and opportunities where science and technology has to come to the fore to, to, in order to provide its greatest value. Um, I will tell you that when I started my career at the National Science Foundation, and at the end of this talk, I'll sort of bring it full, full circle around, I am a Bronze Age uh, classical archaeologist. And so when I came to the National Science Foundation, I uh, was one of the few people actually working in programs that did not have a PhD in the hardcore science, sciences. And I remember at the time, you know, feeling a little insecure about that because virtually everybody that was there was, you know, a PhD physicist or chemist, whatever. And yet when I look back, I do think that I brought a very different perspective to my work at the National Science Foundation that really led me to have the career that I have had because I was a social scientist. And I had, you know, an ability through that educational framework to do a little bit of the connecting of the dots. And I think the connecting of the dots is something that is absolutely critical, more so than ever, because of the challenges we face. What I'm gonna to do tonight is talk about some of the sweeping changes and opportunities around the global competitive landscape. Um, this really is a historic moment in time. And this innovation imperative that we have for the United States um, to really define our future in which science, research, and innovation enterprises are really coming to the fore in new and creative ways. Um, you know, I would just say without question that we are in the midst of a deep transition in the world order of production. It's an era of turbulence, transition, and transformation. And we in the United States, but throughout the world, are grappling with the new realities of a transformed global economy. And in many ways, it's this transition between two ages that is causing a lot of the political disagreement, the inability to reach consensus, and a lot of the, the problems that we're facing in the United States, which of course had such an unfortunate culmination this fall in the shutdown of our government. But what's really driving that, in my view, is this transformation and transition between two uh, world orders of production. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight and look forward to discussion with you all, um, hopefully during the reception. You know, first of all, and you know, we think of this as sort of commonplace, but I want to articulate it because the digital revolution has truly been an epical force of change, and it has accelerated the integrations of the world's economies. When you look over the last 20 years, the amount of mo money flowing across borders grew at more than three times the rate of global GDP. Internationally traded financial assets have soared by a factor of 12. International trade and foreign investment has more than tripled, and global data, data flows are projected to triple over the next five years. And most importantly, the resources for production, knowledge, technology, capital, and skills are all highly mobile. All aspects of industrial production have been transformed, and supply chains, production slicing, wrap around the, the world. For example, companies in seven nations across three continents contributed to the production of the Boeing 787 Dreamliner. The supply chain for the U.S. Olympic snowboarding team's uniforms stretched across six countries and three continents. They were designed in Vermont. The competition fleece was woven in Italy. Waterproof corduroy plant fabric was developed in Taiwan and sewn in Vietnam. Final fabrication was done in Japan, and China produced the accessories. So for emerging and developing economies, this era of change has enabled rapid economic gains. Globalization and the digital revolution have shattered the traditional economic development curve. This revolution has given these nations access to modern production knowledge and tools, again, access to the world's supply chains, markets, and jobs. More than half of FDI now goes to emerging economies, up from 20% in 2000. And this is a huge boost in just a decade. We see developing countries evolving rapidly from resource, commodity, labor-based economies to knowledge and skill-based economies, leaping towards convergence with the developed world. 
Globally, competitive high-tech industries have emerged very rapidly, of course, in countries such as Korea, China, and India. But think of the United Arab Emirates, of Colombia, Brazil, Mexico, Turkey, and now Vietnam. We have evolved also into a multipolar science and technology world. Two-thirds of global R&D is performed somewhere other than the United States, but remember, we still perform one-third of all global R&D. But game-changing technologies can and are originating everywhere and anywhere. How many know that Australia leads the world in quantum computing? The Rhone Alps is a major bioscience center. Ireland, a world leader in financial services software. The Czech Republic coming on strong in low-cost electric vehicles. And of course, Brazil, with its Embraer world-class aerospace capability, is also a leader collaborating with the United States in developing next-generation non-fossil fuel uh, aviation, including the biofuel arena. In just five years, China doubled its R&D investment to more than $200 billion, becoming the world's second largest investor in R&D. And with its purchase of 128 advanced genome sequencers, the Beijing Genomics Institute alone now has more DNA sequencing ca capacity than all of the NIH-supported genome centers combined. Just think of that. Knowledge, information, and technology are widely distributed, increasingly commodities, and accessible globally. What does that mean? It means, for one thing, and a very important thing, that the rewards do not necessarily go to those who have a great deal of these things. Instead, the rewards will go to the countries, the companies, and the people who know what to do with these building blocks once they get them. And so this has created an innovation imperative for the United States, and we have significant opportunities on the horizon. While other countries around the world have shifted into competitive high gear, let's not forget we also are in the game to be competitive now and in the future. Let's look at the energy revolution and manufacturing transformation. Manufacturing and energy are tightly interlinked, and at their intersection lies a historic opportunity for the United States. You know, I remember back when I was in the government, and particularly in the um, late 80s and early 90s, we did have a focus on manufacturing. In a way, what we're seeing today is back to the future, because at that time there was a focus, really, on manufacturing challenges. and. You know, we had a lot of work in the government, the Intelligent Manufacturing Systems Initiative and others, that were really uh, geared to ensure that the United States made things at the intersection of advanced technologies that were so important to our national security. But today, it's pretty well accepted now, in spite of what went on, you know, in the uh, last 10 years where there were some some out in Silicon Valley and elsewhere who said, we don't need to make anything, you know, we're just going to do the design work, we're really only interested in investing in software. There is a widespread realization that manufacturing matters and it is absolutely vital to U.S. economic and national security leadership. And it is the very foundation of our prosperity, standard of living, and influence. This vital role of manufacturing has driven the United States, not just for decades, but really from the time we came out of our um, agrarian society, really in the late 19th century and into the 20th century. The Council on Competitiveness back in 2004 launched our National Innovation Initiative, which was chaired at the time by the CEO of IBM and the president of Georgia Tech, Wayne Clough, who is now our very distinguished secretary of the Smithsonian. And we were looking at how innovation itself had changed and was changing and what it meant for the United States. And we put together, you know, a very forward-thinking policy agenda, uh, many parts of it, parts of which got embedded into the American Competes legislation. But one of the things we looked at, and again, this was really a kind of ahead of the curve, well, what was happening to manufacturing? How would things actually be made 20, 30 years into the future? What would be the role of advanced materials and automation and modeling and simulation? And one of the findings that we had back in 2004 was that manufacturing and services were merging. And a lot of the value was coming from that interface of manufacturing and servicing merging together. An example of that is um, in the company whose CEO now leads the Council on Competitiveness, John Deere. And of course, Deere uh, products, tractors, harvesters are iconic. Um, but Deere is also a weather forecaster. 
Deere is very much involved in the service side of providing very advanced consulting capabilities to farmers throughout the world. So if you have a deer uh, tractor or harvester, you also, you know, can access the weather. You can actually determine how far you're going to plant and when. And so the whole service wrap around deer is very core to its manufacturing of products that today have more advanced electronics capability um, than one of the first generations of our, um, uh, of our space program uh, products. So we launched the Council's Manufacturing Initiative back in uh, 2008 to really look at what is the 21st century American manufacturing renaissance. Here are a few statistics, and some of these you know you, you all know, but I will share them with you because they're important for this story. U.S. manufacturing is growing and leading our recovery now. Last year it grew three times faster than the overall economy. Manufacturing is our global market engine, accounting for 60% of our exports. It has the highest multiplier effect of any industry. For every dollar in manufacturing value added, 1.4 dollars in additional value is created in other sectors of the economy, and U.S. producers remain at the technological frontier, and we have the world's largest set of high-tech manufacturing industries. But very importantly, U.S. manufacturers drive U.S. innovation, accounting for 45 percent of our national R&D investment, 70 percent of private R&D, much of it focused on developing the new technologies and products for global markets. And today, as I've given the example with Deere, high tech infuses every step of designing, developing, fabricating, delivering, and servicing U.S. products. So we have to look at manufacturing as a very extended enterprise that starts with the core ideation and product design all the way through global supply chains and the whole issues of enterprise resiliency around those. Now, energy is the lifeblood of not just the industrial enterprise, but all human activity. And as you know, I don't know who, who coined this, but it's a wonderful um, little sound bite that captures you know, the importance of energy and that energy has always been evolving since the time we became humans, but that we did not leave the Stone Age because we ran out of stones. But remember, stones played a very important role in early uh, energy um, access for human beings when they first discovered how to use flints, you know, to, to uh, generate, self-generate fire. The Council created an initiative also looking at this linkage between energy security, innovation, sustainability, and how it feeds our manufacturing future. And we saw that the potential to increase U.S. energy manufacturing productivity through, yes, greater efficiency was also leading to the production of new forms of energy and energy efficient pro products. Now, fast forward from 19, from, excuse me, 2008, 2009 to where we are today. Unbelievably, we did not predict this back then, but the stars have aligned for us in the energy space, creating a once in the century opportunity. Just five years ago, the tone of the nation's energy conversation was all doom and gloom and scarcity. How are we going to deal with energy scarcity, lack of abundance, and long-term threats to our energy security, and of course, the ever-increasing uh, global trade deficit that was driven by energy? The tone of that conversation has changed dramatically. It's now centered on energy abundance and strength and how to seize emerging energy opportunities to not just revitalize the industrial base, to actually transform it. Overnight, the energy landscape radically changed, and the headlines herald a few of these facts. The United States is the world's largest producer of petroleum and natural gas. Treasure troves of U.S. natural gas and oil unlocked by these new technologies is now here. Just today, there were some very important um, statistics that came out of the Department of Energy on that. We have proved reserves of U.S. oil and natural gas that rose by the highest amounts ever recorded in 2010 since the Department of Energy began publishing reserve estimates. Earlier this year, the United States Geological Survey tripled its estimate of technologically recoverable natural gas in the Bacon and Three Forks formation and doubled its estimate of recoverable oil there. And just a few years ago, U.S. industry was investing in facilities to import natural gas. Just think about that. 
and now we're becoming a potential major national gas exporter. And employment in the U.S. oil and gas industries has increased 40 percent in just five years. Now, a few years ago, when this all kind of came on the scene, um, I had a visit from a minister in Korea to the Council on Competitiveness who was going around the country to understand, you know, what was going on in natural gas and looking, you know, at the horizontal drilling and fracking technologies, which, of course, are an example of long-term investments in research and development. And this gentleman, we were sort of joking at the council, you know, we said, where was somebody's cell phone when he was talking? But anyway, he said to us, we hope that the United States will not use your natural gas to revitalize your manufacturing. <laughs> Hard to believe, but of course, they were immediately making that connection that having this abundant natural gas was going to be a tremendous game changer in manufacturing. And of course, it has. Where we're now seeing U.S. energy intensive industries, such as chemicals, plastics, and steel, having a critical cost advantage and a lot of infrastructure and very advanced infrastructure coming back to the United States. Now, according to the International Energy Agency, natural gas prices, this is very interesting data, are roughly five times higher in Japan, three times higher in the EU, and two times higher in China than those in the United States. And industrial consumers in Japan and the EU are paying more than twice as much for electricity than U.S. producers pay. And even Chinese industrial consumers are now paying almost double the U.S. price. And so when you factor that against GDP and other, you know, metrics, this is a huge, huge burden on the back of our competitors. And really, you know, there was an article a couple weeks, a couple days ago in the Wall Street Journal, this is now a tremendous threat to Germany in their manufacturing sector. And the government is very, very concerned are some of the core big uh, German manufacturers really going to be forced to locate elsewhere because of this energy um, drag on their back operating in Germany. But that's just one example of good news with a large and growing market opportunity. But what's very exciting is all the investments in R&D and the work we've done to develop a very balanced long-term portfolio in energy, including nuclear, very importantly, the renewables, wind, um, thermal, uh, geo, and, and solar are now at the point where the demand is, yes, going strong, but they're almost at the point where they will be um, subsidy-free and will be competitive. And that is very, very good news indeed. The world is thirsty for cleaner energy. Last year, a record $269 billion was invested globally in clean energy technologies, and this was a five-fold increase since 2004 and trillions of dollars will be invested in the decades ahead. And when you think about it, energy and energy efficiency innovations are needed across almost every domain. Transportation, appliances, equipment, green buildings, materials, lighting, fuels, power generation, industrial processes, and consumer goods. And these developments have unfolded with breathtaking speed and scale. American manufacturers now have a golden opportunity to move into this new era of industrial transformation, sustainability, energy innovation, and mar market opportunity. We have a big brass ring to grab onto, and we must seize the moment. Now, the Council on Competitiveness is very excited that we've had a long-term strategic partnership with the Department of Energy, and this year we launched together the American Energy and Manufacturing Competitiveness Partnership, which has two strategic goals. One is to ignite efforts across the country to increase U.S. competitiveness in the production of clean energy and energy efficient products, but through the whole supply chain of energy clean products. And of course, advanced batteries is, as, as you all know, a holy grail for a lot of our energy transformation. But we want to make sure that we have the entire supply chain of next generation batteries, which, you know, when you've seen some of the uh, challenges we had with companies like A123 Batteries that wasn't able to scale for a variety of reasons and now has been acquired by foreign competitors. We want to make sure that as we go forward, we're ensuring that we have an integrated supply chain for clean energy and energy efficient produ uh, production in the United States. And then the other goal is to increase U.S. manufacturing competitiveness across the board to infuse energy efficiency and productivity in every manufacturing sector from pharmaceuticals to otters across the board. So to gain insights from real world experiences and to bring together a new network of leaders, 
We have convened a series of dialogues across the country, taking a hard look at issues ranging from the high capital requirements and the lack of innovation infrastructure to structural costs and low investment that are really hurting the United States and how do we overcome these hurdles and barriers. And we're very much focused on generating solutions and examining models for how the public and private sector can come together in new ways to work together to put partnerships that are new and different from traditional ones in place to accelerate this change. Last week, um, we, the Council convened with the Department of Energy our first ever American Energy and Manufacturing Competitiveness Summit. We were delighted that the, the Secretary of Energy, uh, Ernie Moniz, who brings a tremendous background to this work, uh, <laughs> kicked this summit off uh, with Gene Sperling from the White House and, and members from both parties in Congress. And we brought together a great group of industrial, university, national lab, um, and labor leaders to really talk about how can we catalyze this new set of public-private partnerships to leverage the critical nexus between energy and manufacturing. We released um, a report of our work called Amplify. It's on our website. And we are proposing two public-private partnerships that came out of this network of, of, of dialogues across the country to really accelerate these goals. The first is to create a manufacturing and energy technology accelerator. And this is really meant to be both a real and virtual platform designed to connect our innovation institutions to facilitate this transition of clean energy technologies into products, processes, and scale manufacturing. And really, in a nutshell, nutshell the goal is from startup to scale up. The scale up has been the greatest problem for the United States, it has a lot to do with our industrial structure, it has a lot to do with the fact that we're not accessing debt financing to scale a lot of these opportunities. And it also has a lot to do with where the venture community is investing and where they're not. You know, a lot of, a lot of us know about the, the so-called valley of death. We really have a triple valley of death when it comes to scale up. And this is one of our uh, proposed ideas to address with that. And then the other potential partnership is called the Clean Energy Materials Accelerator. And you know, again, advanced materials are really at the heart of all of this, and we have tremendous opportunities in advanced materials with research well underway in our great universities and industry and labs. So this accelerator is going to create a platform to address common challenges, increasing access to material qualification and characterization tools, and very importantly, bring together the networks to lead on standardization and standard setting for materials. Whoever is able to develop a lead in the standard setting process of some of these new materials is going to have a competitive edge. Now, at the same time that the manufacturing and energy landscape is tilting well in our direction in the U.S., a new age of unprecedented knowledge and technological power and innovation is unfolding. We are not just on the cusp. We are in the midst of four science and technology revolution, revolutions. You all in the room know what they are. The digital, biotechnological, nanotechnology, and cognitive revolutions. They are rewriting the rules of production and services in digital code, genetic code, atomic code, and neural code. Just look at biotechnology. When you think of the inflection point for the commercialization, this cost, you know, of DNA sequencing has fallen through the floor, down a hundred thousandth in a decade. It dropped steeper than decreases in the cost of computing power. It took 13 years and three billion to sequence the first human genome. Last year, the cost dropped to $10,000. The cost is expected to drop to $1,000 this year. To sequence a megabase, one million bases of DNA in 2002, you needed more than $5,000 and several weeks of manual labor to do it. Today, you can do this for 19 cents and a few hours of machine time. Think of that. These remarkable cost reductions change everything in the biotech business, and it's going to open the floodgates of innovation. Nanotechnology, a few comments there. Lux Research estimates that the global sales of products containing some nanotech components could reach 2.4 trillion in 2015, two years from now. Nanotechnology is likely to drive a reordering of production and industry as significant as the change brought about by digital technology, affecting all materials, manufacturing, medicine, energy, food, and warfare. We have a company in the council called Nanometh 
um, that has a whole suite of nanopowders that are really have huge applications across many sectors. One I particularly like, um, since I have uh, two sons that have come out of the Naval Academy and are serving as an ensign in the Navy, and one is a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps, is one of the challenges for our warfighters in Iraq and Afghanistan in their vest, insects got inside. And they had all of these terrible insect bites, could never take these vests off, couldn't clean them. I mean, you can all imagine how awful <laughs> that was. Well, one of Nanomex um, products is called Enguard. And this is a nano powder, and they have a contract with the, the uh, uh, Army now for this, where this nano powder actually is bonded to any material, and it acts both as a insect repellent, but it also delivers medication. And I've said to, the, and this company came out of, of technology at University of Arkansas, and I've, I've said to the CEO, you've got to get that in mattresses, you've got to get it in pillows, just think of the hotel business, you'll become a gazillionaire. But that's just one example of a whole suite of products, um, nano-based uh, powders that are really revolutionary, and that's just the start. And on digital technology, we know that the uh, second phase is well underway, ubiquity, mobility, big data, ubiquitous computing, the Internet of Things, all of that is, is uh, with us, the machine-to-machine -machine technologies um, that are already transforming industries and applications. It's estimated that in the decade ahead, more than 50 billion things will be connected to the Internet, and 14 trillion in economic value is at stake. So with everything going mobile, the penetration of mobile devices has become the emerging platform for service delivery, from entertainment and legal guidance to healthcare, financial services, and education. And then, of course, you know, we're in this era of the data tsunami, and we're swimming in sensors, clickstream, smartphone, digital transaction, text, bar, scans, email, images, video. We're just drowning in data. And big data is gushing in extreme volume, at extreme velocity, in extreme variety. But guess what? We're very rich in data, but we're very poor in insight. So big data and data analytics are the next frontier for innovation and competition. It obviously has huge implications for research, for healthcare, and for many other activities. It also has a huge implication when you couple it to high performance computing and modeling and simulation, well beyond now the potential of petaflop as we move into exascale computing. One of the uh, activities the Council on Competitive is very proud of, we actually catalyzed a new partnership called Endemic, the National Digital Engineering Manufacturing Consortium, about three years ago, where we brought together Lockheed Martin, Procter & Gamble, Deere, and General Electric with Ohio State University, Purdue, University of Illinois, and Argonne National Lab to actually bring modeling and simulation tools high at the high-performance computing level into the supply chain of the manufacturing base in the Midwest. And it's been very, very difficult, quite frankly. But now we have actual results where four small suppliers in the Midwest were about to go bankrupt, and now one of them in particular, I'll mention, Jeco Plastics, is exporting to Germany. We want to take this modeling and simulation capability and carry that out across the United States. And it's very much a frontier for new public-private partnerships. One of the uh, other activities that is changing the game and how we're networking these opportunities is bringing chief technology officers together with the vice presidents for research at universities, with deputy directors of labs, to look at how do we accelerate the business case for these investments in R&D and their commercialization. We at the Council have a group of CTOs called the uh, Technology Leadership and Strategy Initiative, chaired by the CTO of Lockheed Martin, the head of all research for GE, and the CTO of Deere. There are about 50 members now. We've spent a lot of time looking at commercialization, what's going on in our universities, talent issues, as well as what are some of the research priorities that we need to make sure the United States invests in, in a very significant way, as enabling platforms. And one of the very important findings, which I want to um, draw out a little bit, is that this group of CTOs believes that if we don't fuse science, technology, and engineering in a multidisciplinary way with the arts, humanities, and social sciences, we're going to lose tremendous opportunities for the United States. We have to get out of a U.S. research enterprise 
that has been very slow to respond to the rise of multidisciplinarity. We still have too much traditional single discipline, single investigator driven projects that remain the overwhelming dominant model of university research. And the view of this group of CTOs is that our traditional single discipline model does not fit well with many of today's big challenges and innovation opportunities. For instance, in addressing big challenges such as the intersection of food, energy, water, and sustainability, and how they come together in an integrated system, multidisciplinary has to be at the heart of even beginning to tackle that problem. And the mega markets that are emerging around the world, these markets also have to be developed in the context of economic, cultural, and social attributes of nations. When you think of the service economy, almost 80% of U.S. employment and GDP is still in the service economy. It also requires more skill sets than are normally found in the earliest stages of innovation. We have to have the human element of service innovation very much brought in to the technical interface. And so business disciplines like management, marketing, and design need to also be the purview of science and engineering. No one organization or discipline has all the necessary resources for this high value innovation across the spectrum of global needs and opportunity. So as I said earlier, the skill set for the future, where it's really all about differential rates of learning, correlation learning, really requires the arts, humanities, social sciences, business design, marketing, finance, and management, as well as science and engineering. So we have to think of engineers who think like artists and artists that think like engineers. I just love the fact that you had your art program during the 40th anniversary of the fellowship, which really captures this theme of bringing the artist to scientific visualization, the material scientist to fashion, and the cultural anthropologist to market research. We need a cauldron of creativity where talented individuals from all disciplines can collaborate. We've seen some examples of this evolving in academia, but still, for the most part, the stovepipes exist. I'll give you an example, again, from my own personal life now that I've learned about and I'm very excited about. Um, at the U.S. Naval Academy, every midshipman or woman, of course, that goes there ends up as an undergraduate with a full engineering degree. They get all the STEM. You can't go there, get out of there without all that. But guess what? They have another requirement called ELRIC. Does anybody in the room know what ELRIC is? Language, regional expertise, and culture. Every midshipman, in addition to the core engineering and STEM, has to have these other disciplines that require history, philosophy, social sciences, art. All of that is part of their curriculum. So they call that their second ring, and then the third ring is leadership, and they're smashing that all together, and they're producing leaders who think in a very conceptual way that they would not have if they were only a scientist or an engineer in the traditional sense. And that model, in my view, is one that needs to permeate our undergraduate learning at universities. As I said, I'm a classical archaeologist. I'm very regretful that I was never required as an undergraduate to have a single engineering course at all. And I can think of how many uh, undergraduates today whether it's STEM or the opposite, can go through and get their degrees without entering the world and, and getting that crisscross and fertilization that is so important to the future. With this imperative that I've just described, the council has teamed with Lockheed Martin and the National Academy of Engineering to create the National Engineering Forum. Our, our ambition is for the National Engineering to eventually form to become the Davos for engineering. And what we want to do is take the E in STEM and blow it out, because we think the E in STEM is silent. There is much more focus on science and math than there is on engineering. And yet you all know, at the end of the day, it is engineering capability and capacity and competitiveness that brings to life the scientific discoveries and the mathematical tools that enable it. So we've been convening dialogues. Our university presidents and CEOs are hosting these around the country. Uh, last week, we were in Dearborn with the president of Michigan State and the University of Michigan for a discussion with local leaders around engineering. And one of the things that we learned there, University of Michigan, they have a huge demand for undergraduate engineering students. And they have to reject so many because they don't have the capacity. 
to have these undergraduate engineers come in. In my view, when we have such a concern about this, not to be able to have the capacity for American students to come in as an undergraduate and take engineering when they have 3.A and 4.0 averages is a problem. That's going to be one of the things we will address in the National Engineering Forum. Let me conclude by saying that we are again in the midst of this transition between two great ages, from an age in which physical resources were the main factors of production to an age in which ideas, imagination, and creativity are the most important resources. And the United States has so many significant advantages in this new world. We lead the world in high-tech manufacturing and technology-infused services, as I have said. Our supply chains are agile, deep, and diverse. We have a globally unparalleled science and technology enterprise with $400 billion in R&D investment annually, creating the world's deepest well of innovation potential. We possess competitively decisive intangibles, our culture of entrepreneurship, of risk-taking, of creativity, <coughs> of inclusion and diversity is unmatched around the globe. And the energy landscape and the cost calculus for manufacturing have rapidly tilted in our direction. We are creative destructors at every level of our economy and better than most in reorganizing our economy around disruptive technology. And this economic dynamism gives us considerable edge when we face the future. I'll share with you one story. Some of you uh, may be familiar with the Science Technology for Society Forum, which occurs every year in October in Kyoto, Japan. This is a gathering of science ministers, of science leaders, industrialists, policymakers from around the world. It's now going into its 11th year. Um, the president of the AAAS is very active in the STS Forum, and I'm honored to be on the quote, council. We will be meeting uh, right after New Year's um, here at the National Academy of Sciences to plan the 2014 program. The purpose is to look at how science and technology will benefit humankind into the future. So last October in Kyoto, the dinner speaker was Dr. Yamanaka, the Nobel Prize winner for 2012 for his work in stem cell research. Many of you are familiar with him. And I had never really, and he was actually at STS Forum when he got word in 2012 that he had won the Nobel Prize. And of course, the Japanese and everyone was so proud about that. Well, he gave the dinner talk this year. I'd never heard him speak. He's a very dynamic speaker, uh, very amusing, humorous. And he got up and talked about you know, his whole trajectory of research. A lot of his work, as you know, was done at UC San Francisco. So he said, you know, when I came back to Kyoto, I was ill for many years. I had this uh, PAD syndrome, and no one could diagnose it, and I really couldn't do anything. And everybody's sitting in the room thinking, what is, he t what is this disease, you know, PAD? No one knew what it was. And he had a view graph, and he put it up, and he said, post-America depression. <laughs> and he went on to describe in such a beautiful way, he said, I could have never done what we did for this Nobel Prize without that team at UC San Francisco. And he described it, and he showed their pictures. They were from all over the world. They were all ages, you know, they were all genders, all mixed up. And he said, it's that culture of creativity and innovation and risk-taking and inclusion, he used the word inclusion a number of times, that I want to spend the rest of my life creating in Japan. And he really got a standing ovation for that. And so we should be very proud in the United States of that culture of creativity that we nurture and that is part of our culture for science and technology. So again, you know, I'll turn to my, in my last remark here of my role in uh, looking at the continuum of human civilization. As I get older, I find that I'm more and more drawn back to my archaeology and interest in the Bronze Age. And I think of the Bronze Age in the Aegean world, it was really one of the hubs of extraordinary innovation and innovative people. It was a crossroads of change and opportunity, and it really changed the world and enabled what became the flowering of classical Greece and our Western civilization. All of these people in the Mycenaean and Minoan world, when I say all of them, when I, I mean the elites that created their culture and the ones that carried it forward, they were creators of new science and technology. They were multidisciplinary, and they lived on the cutting edge of art, architecture, philosophy, science, technology, engineering, and medicine. The Mycenaeans went all the way to Cornwall in their ships to find the tin that they brought back to create much stronger bronze, which enabled them to have military superiority. 
but they also financed a lot of their wealth creation by selling their pottery, an intangible asset based on design, to pharaohs and the wealthy people in Syria and the Levant. Women had a very powerful role in both the Mycenaean and Minoan civilizations. If you go back and read anything about this, it wasn't just in religion, but in terms of their political hierarchy as well. They were certainly cauldrons of creativity and crossroads of diverse cultures, but they didn't have today's powerful tools for creativity, imagination, and collaboration. Just think if they had the research, computational, and data mining tools that we have today. Imagine the arts, the architects and inventors working in the studios of Renaissance Florence with today's platforms for visualization, graphics, digital design, and rapid prototyping. Imagine the Industrial Revolution with tools for mass customization, service industry mix, advanced materials, and high-performance computing. Now imagine the possibilities if we put these tools and the skills to use them in the hands of millions of Americans and millions of citizens around the world to create a world of abundance, not a world of scarcity. These are all metaphors for the age of ideas, invention, and innovation that's greater than we have ever seen. And I will close with a quote from President Lyndon Johnson. Next time you're all traveling, look at your passport. I don't know if any of you have discovered the beautiful quotes that are at the top of each page that kind of symbolize a lot about American culture and American leadership. This is one I really love that President Lyndon Johnson um, is reputed to have said, and I should find out you know, where he said this because it's quite beautiful and it's relevant to what you all are doing and where my heart and passion is. Quote, is our world gone? We say for farewell. Is a new world coming? We welcome it and we will bend it to the hopes of man. And science and technology and what you all are doing now and in your careers to come is really going to be the core enabler, the creativity, all of that that will create the new world for humankind. So thank you very much for having me. Congratulations for your 40th anniversary. And I wish you all well in your careers, wherever it takes you um, in Washington, in the United States, and around the world. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, how can the new technologies and the internet be used to get people together and fund the kinds of projects we're talking about? Well, obviously, there's a lot of you know effort underway with the internet for um, crowdsourcing and a lot of the uh, innovation that's occurring um, by bringing in people from all over the world around particular problems, and that that is very exciting and. Um, that's an interesting thing because a number of companies that are doing that um, are also kind of rethinking a little bit how they value that to make sure that some of the innovation that's coming from wherever that ends up in a final product, you know, is, is realized. And that gets real complex with intellectual property, but guess what? The world's changing, so it is a wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, you brought up a lot of topics, uh, but I'm going to limit to one question. I'm David Harwell from the American Chemical Society, and I help our members get, uh, get jobs. And uh, in that process, um, you know, the unemployment rate for chemists has gone down, which is a good thing. But for students, it's still quite high. And you, you touched on the difference between uh, what academics and higher education is producing and what industry wants. And I'm just wondering about uh, what learnings you've gained in, in dealing with both, uh, both groups about how can we change uh, academic culture so that they're producing students that can get jobs in industry? That's a great question. Well, you know, we hear so much from U.S. companies that there's a skill mismatch from what they need and what's being produced in our schools. And I would certainly say, you know, speaking to chemistry and its role in materials and so many frontiers, that that should certainly be an area 
where multidisciplinary focus and a broad set of capabilities with maybe chemistry at the core would be something to look at in the curriculum of our undergraduate universities. The other thing, you know, is that many of our uh, professors in our universities are still focusing on educating the students in science that will go on to do PhDs. And I think there needs to be, I don't want to say two tracks, because one being more valuable and prestigious than the other, the teaching track versus those coming into industry. But, you know, I look at a lot of the people I see in these companies that are members of the council who are chief technology officers. They have sets, skill sets and capabilities that are not related to science and technology at all. They can communicate, they can write, they're confident, you know, they know lots of things, obviously business and marketing. So. Uh, encouraging our undergraduates in the hardcore science where they need, of course, to have a lot of focus on mastering that, to also broaden out is very important for their future employability. My name is Vishal Patai. I work for a company called Merck Serono. So after World War II, the U.S. and the Europe, Europeans uh, created the Bretton Woods Institutions, which defined the framework for competition and innovation for the next 50 years. And in your talk, you pointed out that now there are a new group of emerging economies that are now competing that also have to participate in this framework for competition. And most of these countries were not really party to those discussions. And a lot of them are gaming the, uh, the, the framework and the rules that really define the success of the U.S. and the EU. What do you think is a way for us to engage with these emerging economies that are playing a larger role in the competitive landscape? to really bring them into a, a, a new framework that actually allows for fair competition across, uh, across uh, national boundaries? Well, thank you for that. That's another great question. You know, clearly, the multilateral trading system um, played an extremely important role with successions of multilateral trade agreements to actually create a framework that expanded global commerce, that expanded both exports and imports, brought down tariffs and enabled a lot of the um, uh, transformation of these economies to be real players in the global economy. Now we're seeing not just a breakdown in the multilateral framework, there have been a few successes there, but a lot of uh, bilateral and regional trade agreements that are being formed. And, you know, the United States is participating in the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Um, which Japan is now coming in a little late in the game. And of course, what's interesting is the Japanese are now dealing with the fact that their farmers and many of their protected industries don't want to let down the gates, as it were. I think we have to continue to push on the both multilateral, multilateral and the bilateral trade frameworks, but I think we have to use other tools as well. And that comes through collaboration. So one of the things that this is potentially much greater than it is right now, but we, we have now a new Global Federation of Competitiveness Councils that has about 30 members in it. The U.S. Council helped form this. But these councils, it's interesting, some are mainly private sector, others have government leaders. But we're using competitiveness strategy as an umbrella to look at all of these things. And the, the country that we really forged this with, that we have a very deep relationship that's leading the way on a lot of these things, believe it or not, is Brazil. Brazil used to be the poster child for protected economy, you know, for high walls, all, you know, the indigenous uh, development strategy, bad intellectual property. But now, Brazil is a player globally beyond commodities. I mentioned Embraer, but they have huge capabilities. You know, they're the largest food, agricultural food producer and exporter in the world outside of the United States. So we're seeing them play a stronger role in saying, why is intellectual property important? Why is rule of law and transparency? They still haven't done such a good job in bringing down their tariffs on industrial products. But anyway, I, I guess my answer would be, we all in this room have the capacity to forge collaborative networks and partnerships. And bringing others in, that is another way to begin to shape, shape that um, change that you're referring to. When My name is Dorothy Jones Davis. I'm a AAAS fellow at the National Science Foundation within the Engineering Directorate, so I really appreciate Great. your comments about engineering because we feel the same way. Um, uh, my question is around uh, sort of asking, what, I what, is your thought what are your thoughts on uh, informal education experiences such as makerspaces and this new sort of fab lab, makerspace uh, 
culture shift, and especially your thoughts around the importance of such informal education experiences in K-12 and shaping K-12 so that we're creating the next generation of people that think more towards the innovation space that you're, th that you're foreseeing for our future. I think it's great, and I think that maker culture, um, you know, it, more and more of us are aware of it, but I think it's very deep, and I think the informal education and the projects and things that can be encouraged um, in very diverse spaces, you know, as long as it can kind of grow and be inclusive, that's my only concern. You know, the children who don't come from families that provide these external opportunities, sometimes, sadly, school is the only place they have to learn and get some of the disciplines for learning. So I think we need to encourage both um, for that. And, you know, also on this tinkering culture, I guess the maker movement is a lot of the old-fashioned tinkering. Um, girls are beginning to do it, too. Um, there are lots of ways for, for girls to participate in that. So I think it's a very, very exciting. And the Smithsonian has a new project called Badging. I don't know how many of you heard of this. They want to take, you know, the traditional Girl Scout, Boy Scout badging. You know, you'd get a badge if you, you know, could identify every tree of every, every leaf of every tree or whatever they would be. Um, but actually turn those, that badging into real knowledge that's not school-based that if you can actually show you've learned these capabilities, you get a Smithsonian badge that becomes a credential that goes beyond, you know, just the classic school credentials. So there's some exciting things on that, and NSF has a very important role to play. Uh, Dave Rabinowitz, I'm a retired engineer, and I have a question about business schools and, and, and education, because business schools have traditionally taught short-term profit focus and have generated a lot of graduates who tend to be technophobic and averse to innovation. And I'm wondering if that's changing, if there's any active attempt to change that. I, I think it has. Um, I agree with you know, everything you said about you know, a lot of the focus in business schools. And of course, um, I didn't get into this, it's a whole different discussion, but our capital cost structure in the United States is very anti-innovation friendly and our regulatory environment. And so, you know, that whole way we uh, value intangible assets and the shareholder, all of that has some challenges for making the long-term investments. I mean, did anybody read in the paper today that so many companies now are buying back their shares? Far more than investing in R&D because it pushes up the value of their share, so the CEOs and others, you know, get... So we have some real issues around that, and um, it's concerning. And the rest of the world, I mean, I'll give you another example with Brazil. I'm very jealous that we don't have a equivalent of the Brazilian National Economic Development Bank. We have the Exim Bank, and of course we provide guarantees and all sorts of things for the export of U.S. products. But guess what? If you try to do the same infrastructure investments in the United States, there's no guarantee, no debt capital. We need a national infrastructure bank here in the United States that will enable us to do some of this long-term financing that companies aren't doing. Um, an example of somebody at business school that's interesting is the former CEO of Pepsi, is now the dean of the business school at Wake Forest. And some of these former CEOs that are now coming into business schools, I think are playing a really important role in educating the next generation of business leaders. Mitch Ambrose from the Science and Technology Policy Institute. You spoke a fair amount about our domestic energy revolution and the role of it in revitalizing manufacturing. Could you just reflect on the role of automation in bringing manufacturing back to the United States, but also um, comments on its impact on competitiveness, given that jobs won't necessarily be coming back with the manufacturing? Yes, and I, I should have mentioned automation and self-assembly materials and all of those things that are part of the, the, the future of manufacturing that are underway. There's no question that automation and smart sensors and all of that has changed the factory environment. And, you know, you can go to many uh, manufacturing facilities in the United States and you don't really see humans now on the floor the way you did on a traditional manufacturing line. And so this whole issue of the transition of workers and the training that you need to function in that environment is a real national imperative. I personally believe um, that over time, because of the culture we have and being very resilient, that we will begin to see um, an ability to retrain our people the way we did when people came off farms and things. You know, we have, again, the highest productivity in agriculture, very small 
percentage of our people actually working in farms. But um, the displacement of human beings in the manufacturing environment is very serious, and particularly people, you know, who are of a certain age where it's hard to do, quote, the, the retooling. So it, it is a big issue, and it's getting, going to be even worse for countries like China. I mean, the Chinese are very, very scared about, you know, additive manufacturing and all those things because, again, it completely upsets a job protection, job creation model for them and for us. My name is Kwa Jik Lee. I'm an American Physical Society, American Mathematical Society, and also IEEE member. Um, my question is that I'm glad that you mentioned that we need to train more uh, Renaissance uh, type of people. And but unfortunately, what I understand, uh, in fact, my last uh, job was uh, at the university you know, engineering school. We are trying to, and most, a lot of engineering schools try to, because of the more materials they need to uh, absorb, so they cut down uh, the requirements on, you know, uh, on, I call it uh, liberal arts education. You know, so that's what I'm asking is that, is there any way the industry can influence or put pressure on academia that they need to train more broad-based, uh, more, you know, all-rounded people and students saying we got a very special ones that we can only do a little pick, pack, you know, round pack, and cannot fit into the square hole. I mean, so what's your, what's your thoughts on how can industry influence or government influence educational academia, particularly in training, broad-based, uh, you know, training? Well, you know better than I how difficult it is to change the curriculum in universities. <laughs> and the role of faculty in that. I do think there is a recognition at the level of our university presidents across the board that this is important, what we're talking about. Um, I also have heard at these national engineering forums just what you said. There's not enough time in the curriculum as it is for engineers. How can we add anything else and all of that? So I think it's going to be um, a, a big theme for our national engineering forum and our job between now and beginning of 2015, when we expect to, to have the first form, is to really come up with some specific recommendations how to address just one of the questions that, that you've said. And um, I think that uh, another challenge is in our graduate education as well for engineering. And, you know, we do, as, as you know, have a dearth of, of Americans going into graduate education comparing to non-American students who come for this. And one, we need to ensure that they can stay if they want to and contribute. But also, I think that some of the qualifications for non-American students coming in to graduate in engineering should be that they have to bring some of those credentials with them, some of the liberal arts, and not just come in based on, you know, the, the core STEM capabilities. I, I'll tell you one story. My, one of my sons has a classmate who's now an ensign in nuclear, he's going on nuclear subs, and this kid was like so brilliant and very funny too. He's down in Charleston now in the nuclear school, nuclear power school, and he's like a 4.0. He was, he did everything, he's a really exceptional young man. And um, he got a master's degree and while he was still at the Naval Academy. And so I said to him once, Joe, what was your hardest subject at the academy? And he said, oh, history, it's terrible. I said, history? How can you say history? He said, oh, there was no right answer. <laughs> and of course, he had to do all that. And now he's happy he did. But I think that captures a little bit what you're trying to say, or we're all trying to say here. Good evening. I'm Michael Plavka, a student here at Georgetown uh, the School of Foreign Service. I'm from the Czech Republic, so I'm very appreciative of you mentioning the country. Uh, I'm really talking about, or I'd like to really ask about uh, how you see Europe um, be, you know, framed or how, what role Europe plays in this world, especially talking about emerging markets, but maybe about thinking how, how we would like to shape the world in terms of regulations, in terms of facing academic freedoms in China or cyber security violations. So sort of thinking about how we want to use the technology and innovation we have to really bring it to people who need it, but also to expect for treatment from those who are using it in the developing world. So basically, what uh, role you see Europe playing and whether Europeans should uh, play a stronger role. Thank you. Well, one of the areas where I think the US and, and Europe should come together, um, both at the EU level but also bilaterally, is to really um, work on this multilateral trade 
uh, renaissance, and of course, agricultural subsidies are a huge issue there. Um, but as you mentioned on cybersecurity and some of these things, um, there needs to be, and this is real hard, there needs to be more transparency on um, the examples of the cyber attacks coming for pure commercial purposes. You know, we're obviously dealing with the, the aftermath of the Snowden thing where, you know, the, the, the quote, spying for political, national security purposes, whatever, that's come out and has had very deleterious effects. Um, I'm really surprised as a former U.S. government official that the U.S. government is being very tepid in sharing to the world how much all of that's been directed against us, but they must have their reasons for not doing that. Here's an idea I posed. Um, I'm on a commission called uh, the Commission on the Theft of American Intellectual Property. It's chaired by Admiral Dennis Blair and uh, former Gover Governor John Huntsman, and the former CEO of, of Intel's on it, myself, a former uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense. And our report, first report, came out in May. And right now, on intellectual property theft, the burden of dealing with this is all on the entity that has had something taken from them. So for instance, if we think of being in an art museum and there's a painting stolen, um, the burden of responding to that would be on whoever had something stolen, not the perpetuator. There's no consequences. So an idea we have is how we push back you know, the burden of not stealing intellectual property onto the uh, perpetuator. So here's one of the ideas. And that is that you cannot bring into the United States or most European countries food products and medical devices and pharmaceuticals that do not meet very stringent regulatory standards. If you're going to import Kellogg's cereal, I understand, into Europe, there are six different standards of how much vitamin D is allowed in that cereal before it can be brought in. So we need to think about creating some standards around intellectual property. So if you are a producer of any product, you need to certify that your product does not incorporate the theft or misuse of intellectual property before it comes in, just like you have to certify that a milk product or whatever has the proper things. That would be very difficult to do, but the US and the EU could quite frankly do that. And it would really change the game on the intellectual property issues. And of course now cyber attacks are directly used for incising IP. Hi, um, I'm Jessica Brooks from the Science Technology Policy Institute, and I'm curious about energy startups. So there are so many barriers for energy startups compared to, say, digital startups, um, and that's really where a lot of the innovation comes from in a given industry. So I'm wondering if during your um, dialogues that you had about energy, have you come up, have you heard any solutions to the challenge of you know, energy startups being able to enter the marketplace? Well, one of our, um, I don't know if it's a solution, but one of the paths we're going to work on on this accelerator um, for knitting together the ecosystem is to really begin to work about how we can knit the small innovative startups very quickly with companies that can help them go to scale and help finance. And a sector where that's done, and it's been done from its inception, is the relationship between the biotechs and the pharmas where the pharma industry often you know, works very closely with innovative biotech startups to both invest in them and sort of you know, keep that development along the way. Sometimes they acquire them, sometimes they become companies like Amgen, but there's a much deeper collaborative relationship that goes on in that sector that could be a model for others. But you know, to depend on venture capital mm -hmm. to scale up most energy um, innovations is not the path, and we have to look at other ways to do that. It's not that they don't have a place to play, but I can tell you, I mean, it breaks my heart. I have been in so many meetings where I've heard venture capitalists say we could care less where something's made, we're ready to exit our investment, and we want our 30% internal rate of return, and you know, we, you know, we're happy if the risk reduction is done, we get our money, and it goes and scales up in China or India or wherever. That's not good for the United States. So we're going to work on that. We'd love your thoughts and advice. <laughs> It's, 
It's, uh, I had just a, f a few more comments. Um, it's always wonderful to hear such a broad, sweeping topic um, presentation that can present um, not only uh, clearly lay out some of the challenges, but also end on an upbeat note about um, opportunities. I think this was a particularly fitting um, wrap-up for our 40th anniversary, um, a talk that highlights so well um, and positively the role of science and technology in addressing um, everything from energy issues to a broad range of other social challenges um, and having a clear, clear role in being able to address those um, and make change. It was interesting when I was hearing about the Bronze Age and the um, Mycenaeans was thinking, oh, they would have been great S&T policy fellows. <laughs> Clearly, they had all the characteristics that we, that we look for, um, diversity of perspectives, career stages being brought together. Um, our program is so interdisciplinary with a broad range of science and engineering backgrounds, health and medical, geosciences, computational sciences. Um, and really bringing that together. So I, again, I thought that this, this was just a perfect wrap up to um, highlight where we are in the US, opportunities we have here and globally, but also the role that all of you, science and technology policy fellows in the audience and others, have to make sure that R&D and science and technology and engineering are really um, used and put forward to help um, address some of these issues. Before we um, go out to enjoy uh, the reception, I want to put a, a shout out to my colleagues um, who are our team who oversee our outreach, marketing, communications, um, web issues, um, and recruitment. That's Olga Francois, Salaha Sharif, Stephanie Bing, and Barry uh, Williams. Some um, Olga and Barry in particular have been the leads on this um, series of, of uh, lectures, but also that entire team has had the role in putting together a grand 40th anniversary um, program for all of us. So please join me in thanking them for all their efforts. Um, and then right now, please join us for um, this reception to once again celebrate the wrap up of our 40th anniversary. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Oh, yeah, thank you.